I'm now talking to Doug Simons. Doug is the executive director of Canada France Hawaii Telescope and an astronomer. Doug, where are we now relative to getting all of the observatories atop Mount Kea into full operation? It's a different story with each telescope. CFHT was first out of the starting block Saturday night because we have a cooling system that was operational for the full shutdown. Telescopes that required liquid cryogens, um, most of those instruments are warm and it could take anywhere from days to weeks to bring them back online. There was some information in the news that 500 people work at the summit and that is just not my understanding. How many people actually are up at the summit of Mauna Kea on a daily basis? Yeah, good question. So it's between five and 600 total that work at the observatories. Most work at the base facilities in Hilo and Waimea. Uh, Monday through Friday, it's typically 50 to 75, and at night, uh, maybe a couple dozen that are on the summit itself. The process begins roughly 24 hours ahead of each day, where we notify Office of Mauna Kea Management how many vehicles each telescope will send up the next day. That information is relayed to law enforcement, who relays it to uh, the protesters. We average about 40 to 50 vehicles per day on a normal day, so quite a bit of traffic. Our primary concern is that we call the satellite like the spur road or the side road, which is actually the old, old saddle road for a portion of it. And then there's a pathway demarked by cones and reflectors across a lava field to allow us to get up and above the so-called Kupuna tent. We are very concerned um, not about the safety of our staff members. They're in big, heavy SUVs. We're concerned about pedestrians. You're literally driving through an encampment. At night, and I've done this so many times, you have high wind and really thick fog. And this is a single lane path with no lights, with tents on either side of it. And you can imagine you know, the possibility of something going wrong as we're trying to navigate through that in, in pitch black with zero visibility. So we are very eager to get Mount Kea Access Road opened up, primarily as a means of separating pedestrian traffic and vehicle traffic and keeping everyone safe in the process. I'm also with Jessica Dempsey, who is the Deputy Director of the East Asian Observatory, which includes the James Clerk Maxwell Telescope. And we've had some really good discussions about that because the James Clerk Maxwell was instrumental in getting the image of the black hole, Povehi, last April. Aloha, Jessica. Thank you for having me, Sherry. Jessica, what's the situation with the East Asian Observatory these days at Mauna Kea? The good news is that after four weeks of downtime, we did manage to get back on sky on Sunday night. We don't have staff up at the summit right now. We are operating remotely. This doesn't mean we're at full operation. We actually had to take one of our instruments down to a non-functioning state because it went into a critical error during the time where we couldn't have access. So that's going to take us about four weeks of repair work to get back and functioning. But we have one instrument up there and on sky, so we're very pleased to get started. Well, I know you're happy, and I can see it by the smile on your face after having no access for almost a month. But what are the implications of not being able to be at full capacity for the East Asian Observatory and even some of the other telescopes atop the mountain. We have a lot of demands for our science and our instrument suite uh, takes ad full advantage of the different weather conditions, uh, the different kinds of science. So it means that our science scope is limited. It means we can't get the science for as many users as we would normally do. So we really are anxious to get back up to that fully functioning state. If you have nobody up there during the days, how is maintenance being handled? Because I know that's a pretty critical component. That's right. We are starting to get our day crews up there in the daytime during the weekdays. That is good. The access isn't as safe or consistent as we would like. But our crews are very professional and careful. So for now, they're making do. And I think that they're awesome. I know that most all of the telescopes get people from different universities around the world using those observatories, using those telescopes for their particular work. Those people who had reservations for the time that there's been a shutdown and even now aren't getting to observe, what happens to those people? Do they somehow get priority to go back on or do they go to the end of the line again? Help us understand the implications. It does depend on the observatory. We had to cancel a number of our observers, scientists who were going to be coming out from a range of locations around the world. And of course, that's very disappointing for them. We will try and flexibly get some of their science back in the queue, but there is never a guarantee that will happen. With some of the other observatories, they apply a year, sometimes six months in advance, and they won't get that time back. Uh, across the observatories, dozens of students have missed their observing time, and that will affect their graduation, and that one's one that personally you know, really hurts for me. 
2,000 hours across the observatories of lost time. About a year and a half worth of discoveries were lost across all of the telescopes. And we'll just really never know, in some cases, what was missed. So it's been pretty hard, but our staff are pleased that we're starting to get back moving again. What does somebody do if they are a student and they had observing time and their graduation, their thesis, their PhD thesis is based on that? What happens then? Do they, uh, well, what happens then? We'll make the best accommodations we can. I mean, students are our priority. Getting our next generation of scientists up and running is one of our driving motivations. So I hope that in every case we can find a way to get them their science in time for them to be able to put a good showing forward for their graduation. Anything else you'd like to add, Jessica? We finally got our instrument, Namakanui, as named by Professor Larry Kimura, up to the summit four weeks late. And so our staff are getting very nervous uh, because we have a very narrow window to get it working before the next round of Event Horizon Telescope observations. So it was a great relief to get it there. And uh, it's like kind of unpacking Christmas present for our staff. They're really thrilled to get him up there and uh, so we're going to be working really hard and looking forward to doing that next round of black hole hunting. So that's what this new instrument will allow you to do? That's right. It's going to be four times more sensitive than the one that took the image of Povehi. So we're going to be able to make even greater impact in this next round of Event Horizon Telescope observations and we're really excited. Define Event Horizon Telescope one more time for us, please. Sure, and this is because you need a telescope the size of a planet in order to image a black hole. And so we connect eight, actually it's going to be nine telescopes this time across the world in order to make this planet-sized telescope in order to go hunting for these tiny black holes. Rich Matsuda is the Operations Director for Keck Observatory. Aloha, Rich. Aloha. Rich, what's the current status of Keck Observatory and its being able to be fully back online? We're coming back into operations. After having been off sky for about four weeks, we had to put a lot of our infrastructure and instrumentation into a hibernation mode. We're working our way back out of that. We observed for the first time on Tuesday evening with both Keck 1 and Keck 2 telescopes doing science again, which is great to be back on sky. But because about half our instrumentation was put into this safe mode during the four-week layoff, we've had to bring them back slowly, cautiously, and we're limited by the amount of equipment we have to bring things back online. So rather than doing it all at once, we have to do it in a serial fashion. So it'll take about another week and a half, two weeks, to get us back all the way up to online to where all our capabilities are, are back in operational state. What happens to those people who had observing time, which I know has to be reserved months or longer in advance, if they lost the observing time during this last month? What's their situation? Do they get it back? Do you bump other people or what? Basically, most of them will lose the time. If we have any engineering time that we can give back to scientists, we do, but we need that engineering time to test the telescope, make sure it's working. We regularly have to do these kind of tests to keep it in optimum condition. If there's any of that that we don't absolutely have to use, we'll give it back to scientists, but I would say 90 to 100% of them will lose their time. I've taken a look now at the road that the scientists and the engineers and technicians have to use, and it is next to the existing Saddle Road, Daniel Kanoe Highway, but it really, in my observation, looks like sort of a rapidly, hastily put together cinder road. It doesn't look great, but tell me how it's working for you guys, because I know you have to take instruments up and such, so tell us just a little bit about that. Sure. So as far as getting people up and down, we use that side road that you referred to. At the very end, there's a pretty narrow path over lava, and that was improved slightly with the Department of Transportation. They put cones and markers to mark out the lane, which made it a little more safe. They put down some gravel as well. So we've been um, having our crews go through there. It's largely been cordial. The main aspect we're worried about is the safety of the public. So you're having 30 or 40 observatory vehicles going through that pathway on a daily basis. And there's people parked, camping, walking in that area. While the interactions are fine, we're just worried about the possibility of an accident, which would be a worst case scenario for anyone. As far as critical equipment, there have been a couple cases now where we've had to use the, um, the main access road. 
And so what we do is we ask Office of Mauna Kea Management to notify law enforcement who notifies and makes an arrangement. We have to show up at a certain time and then we're allowed to enter the main access road, but we have to go around the Kupuna tent onto the shoulder to get around that and then get up the hill. And we've done that a few times now successfully.